liebe Gäste, ähm, liebe Studierende, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, ich heiße Sie alle sehr herzlich willkommen zum heutigen Vortrag von Raphael Labanino mit dem Titel Interest Representation in Illiberal Times, the Case of Hungary. Dieser Vortrag ist Teil der Vortragsreihe Machtwechsel im Osten Europas, Politik und, Wandel und Gesellschaft im Wandel, die wir in diesem Herbstsemester 2021 organisieren im Rahmen der Schweizerischen Osteuropa Bibliothek in Bern. Mein Name ist Eva Maurer, ich bin die Leiterin der Bibliothek und ich werde den heutigen Abend moderieren. Und der heutige Abend wird eben, wie angekündigt, als Podcast aufgezeichnet. Ich möchte also auch alle herzlich begrüßen, die das später anhören. Vielleicht als Referenzpunkt heute ist der 14. Oktober 2021 für alles, was unser äh, Gastredner heute sagen wird. Ja, jetzt werde ich auf Englisch wechseln, weil der heutige Vortrag auf Englisch stattfinden wird. Two weeks ago. Petra Guasti gave us, I thought, an excellent comparative overview over the state of democracy as measured by the state of horizontal, vertical and diagonal accountability in the Visegrad countries, that is in the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland and Slovakia. And today we will really zoom in on one country and look at one country a bit closer, one country which did not do well regarding many of the indicators we looked at two weeks ago whether it was corruption or the state and independence of the media, an erosion of the rule of law or attempts at repressing civil society and unduly influencing elections. So I'm really happy to have a speaker here tonight to be able to introduce him who will look at a multiple of those issues today. And I'm especially happy that this speaker is our former colleague, Rafael Labanino, who is actually with us today in person. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, quite a nice uh, change after such a long time zooming. Rafael has uh, studied in Budapest, where he holds two master's degrees, one of them from Central European University. He is, among many other expertise, an expert on political economy, reform and welfare politics, party systems and organized interests. He was um, a member of a joint research group between 2011 and 2016, a research group at the University of Bern and Geneva, uh, which analyzed liberalizing policies, re policy reforms. A very big project, which you can find more online. Today, he's a research fellow at the Department of Politics and Public Management at the University of Constance. He has been working since 2018 on a project which was called The Missing Link, examining organized interests in post-communist policy making. And the book stemming from this project has just been published. I will pass it around so you can have a look at it. And today, tonight, we will also get a little bit of insight into the book. Apart from that, maybe I'd like to add that Rafael has also been working as a journalist for several Hungarian media outlets. And that will maybe some be something we can explore in the discussion. Anyway, I'm very glad you came tonight. I'm very glad the Deutsche Bahn did everything possible <laughs> and impossible <laughs> to bring you here and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. And as usual, you will have the possibility to ask questions afterwards. Raphael will pre present in English, but I think you can also pose questions in German, right? So, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we will have a, a polyglot discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind words, and I'm really happy to, to have the opportunity to be here and, and, uh, and uh, showcase this, this research and research project that we've been working on at, at my alma mater at the University of Bern. I have really fond memories uh, uh, of this university, and, um, and I'm really, really honored to, to have the opportunity to be here today. Uh, so I will talk about uh, three studies on the demise of interest intermediation in, in Hungary. Um, so bear with me. Uh, this discussion will, will introduce you to three uh, articles. So one book chapter and two journal articles. One is just a conference paper at the moment, but uh, anyway, it's going to be a journal article. And... Um, and I will not really talk about, uh, or I will also introduce the, the stories, uh, so the, <laughs> these problems of, of how social dialogue was, was uh, abolished in Hungary or, or uh, the academic freedom under attack. But, uh, but I will more talk about theories and how to analyze such 
such uh, events or such, uh, such outcomes uh, with the help of, of political science and, and sociology theories and, and um, process tracing methods and, and statistics. Uh, but but you, don't, you, you don't need to have any background in these, in these literatures or in these methodologies. I will explain everything, but I think it's, it's more fruitful to, to have a theory-based discussion to, you know, to, to explain outcomes and not just say that it's because of, of, of backsliding. We have to operationalize backsliding, so we have to kind of grasp these, these, um, these complex uh, phenomena and, and make it into something parsimonious to, in order to, to explain what happened. Uh, and of course, we cannot give a full account. Uh, we just try to explain some, some very specific outcomes. Uh, so it, my, my uh, um, presentation will be like, like uh, an, uh, an onion. We will start with an overall uh, quantitative uh, approach uh, on interest group access. I will also clarify what access means <laughs> in, this, in, in this literature. And then we will kind of zoom into the case of social dialogue in Hungary, how it was abolished, and then we will zoom into the case study of, of academic freedom and protests uh, in, in the past 10 years, two protest waves, which are taking place in this environment of, 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 uh, of lack of access to the policymaking uh, arenas and, 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 and policymakers and Within, within, uh, within this context of abolished social dialogue, particularly in, in the public sector, so in higher education as well. So, and then we will understand the context of these, of these, of these protests and, and, and why and how these interest groups in higher education tried to, to kind of deal with these, these challenges uh, in, in Hungary. So, first of all, uh, you, last week you had, I think you had been introduced to these, to these methods and indices of, on backsliding. Uh, and now I want to operationalize this, this is backsliding before we get on uh, with, with, the, uh, with this presentation. Um, and I think um, this concept of Kim Lane Chappelle, uh, who is a, a constitutional lawyer from the US and, it's a, and she's a, a, an expert um, among others on Hungarian Constitutional, um, <laughs> constitutional law, actually. Um, she called this, this, this uh, the strategy of, 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 uh, of elected, elected authoritarian leaders like, uh, like Viktor Orban, um, autocratic leg legalism. So these, these people don't, you know, um, grab the power and, and I don't know, uh, arrest uh, their opponent, opponents or uh, so nothing happens if you go to Budapest, it's a beautiful place. <laughs> uh, you can enjoy your time. Uh, you can have discussions with, with, uh, with all kinds of people. Uh, the bookshops are full of books from, from everywhere in the world. So you don't have this kind of uh, um, overt repression. What you have is, is, is a gradual hollowing out of democracy through legal means. So, and, and actually, Viktor Orban is a, is a master in this because he's a really good and shrewd lawyer, actually. He's a lawyer by training and, and was a really uh, bright law student um, at the most elite institution of Hungary, so he knows this game. Um, so lawmaking is weaponized against uh, the opponents or against sectors that, that are uh, bound to, to be taken uh, on by the government. Parliament is rubber stamping laws without any consultation. Um, so they are using legal loopholes that, for example, in Hungary, um, single like members of parliament can introduce legislation yeah, into, the, into the parliament without, uh, of course, they need to get it through to a committee, but in the committee, his party has every committee, his party has the majority. So it's easy to, to push through legislation by, by, by individual uh, members of parliament. Um, and of course, this, this, uh, this institution uh, is made for the opposition, yes, not for the government. Uh, so it was, it was told to, to give an opportunity to, to members of parliament who doesn't have uh, a government or, or maybe doesn't even have a faction, parliamentary faction behind them. Um, but they're using it to, to introduce legislations just you know, out of the blue, 
um, on a Tuesday, and by Thursday it's adopted, and that's it. And there's no negotiations, there's no consultations with anyone. Um, the Constitution actually was, adop was, uh, was adopted like this in 2011. Uh, it's, uh, it was only supported by FIDES, and it was also adopted, uh, it was introduced and, and adopted in such kind of a um, very, uh, um, very uh, not open manner. Um, and laws and institutions do not check the government anymore, but ensure the increasingly authoritarian nature of governance and corruption. So this is that you put your your friends and 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 and, uh, and trusted uh, people into institutions that are supposedly check the government. So I think Petra Guasti must have talked about it. So this is kind of the this is how you neutralize horizontal um, um, uh, check on on governmental power. So this is kind of the framework of, of what is happening in Hungary or in Poland. Um, yes, so uh, the overall, so kind of the bird's eye view on, on how, to, how to measure what is going on in these countries, um, we need to talk about a theory or a more, better Better is to say a uh, uh, framework, a uh, political opportunity structure, um, which is actually um, uh, the political opportunity structure is, uh, is the main uh, social science framework of, of contentious politics. So it, it is used actually to, to look at protest. Um, but um, in interest group uh, research, in interest group uh, literature, and one of the most important uh, and most measurable, because it's the most measurable aspect of the quality of deliberation or involvement of social, societal interest in policy making is the frequency of access to interest groups of to different policy making venues. So it is easy to measure with, with, with survey methods. So that's why we, we tend to use it. It's really difficult uh, to measure quantitatively uh, if, if they have an effect, if they really have a measurable effect on policy outcomes. That I will, we, will, we will look at that, but that's process tracing, so you cannot really do it quantitatively. But you can ask interest groups, uh, leaders, that, okay, how, how frequently do you meet this and this and that policymaker? How frequently are you, uh, are you invited to, to the parliament, to, I don't know, to committees, and so on and so forth? So this is, this is why if you open, uh, if you hit Google Scholar in, and, and, and type in interest group access, you will get a lot of, lot of articles. But you will also see that this research agenda is almost entirely focusing on organizational level characteristics and not the political context. Uh, it is partly because it comes from the US and, on, and then was adopted to the EU and Western European, um, Western European context and it's usually single single case studies of one national context where it doesn't really make sense to, you know, there's no variance in the institutional setup if you just have one country. Uh, so that's why they, they uh, usually focus on the level of professionalization, financial resources, the type of interest, is it a business interest or is it a cause group like environmental group, for example, is it a union, is it an employer's organization, um, a chamber of commerce, type of information provided by organizations to policymakers. So this is an organization maybe uh, enjoying higher level access because it has, it has really good legal, uh, legal uh, expertise in a field where legal expertise is needed uh, and the lawmaker uh, needs this kind of expertise. And of course, long-term organization survival, which is to say that that other organizations usually enjoy higher access than new ones. So this is kind of not, <laughs> it's uh, quite trivial. Uh, but um, I think it's, it's important to look at the, um, the political context. And although political opportunity structure, as I said, was, was um, uh, conceived as, as a framework in explaining social mobilization, and so protests and founding of interest groups, movements, um, uh, it, is, it, it has been used also in interest group research and interest group formation. And uh, the political process approach um, uh, by Kesey and Kitschelt uh, allows us to, to post testable hypotheses on, on interest group access. So uh, this is kind of the um, Kesey's uh, framework. So he, this is how he, he made it into a formal framework. Uh, 
but let's move on. Um, so, if excess is our dependent variable, I would say that our most important variables are, in, from, from the political context, uh, is the fragmentation of mandates in Parliament, because less concentrated party systems allows for more access. Yes, so if you have more parties, many parties, the, you know, there are coalition governments, you have more access. But if you have kind of close, like one, two party systems or, or a dominant party system, then the party can, this dominant party can afford not to really listen to anyone. Um, or it's more difficult to get access. And corporatism. So if you think about, for example, Germany, uh, there is kind of this, this tripartite corporate system where you have the, uh, the employers, the, the unions, and the government. And then these kind of systems usually tend to uh, um, favor large encompassing organizations and in pluralist systems like the U.S. where you have 50 states and you know, a lot of lobbyists and, and there is no kind of a, um, uh, institutionalized forum for, for this for such kind of corporatist, uh, uh, in, no, there's no corporatism at, at all actually. Uh, there you have um, uh, a much more dynamic uh, lobbying framework and more organizations getting access. So this is kind of the usual suspects, I would say. Um, but of course, uh, the thing is more, the thing is much more complicated because there's another competing framework with this, which, which we also have to take into account. Uh, this is the population ecology framework. Um, it's, it comes from biology and it looks, as, looks at actually uh, interest groups as, as populations. So not at individual interest groups, but, but it says it's population. This is kind of like you, you would, for example, not, um, not explain how many bears there are in a forest with, with, you know, with, with saying that this bear is really, really good at picking, I don't know, berries. But you would say that you would say that there are I don't know hundred bears, so many berries, so many I don't know deers, and then the hundred and one bear will starve, and that, that's why you have just have hundred bears. Yeah. So this is kind of the population ecology framework for human organizations as well. It it explains uh, dense. It, it explains the the um, uh, the number of organizations, and they're actually there. There's their also also access to to um, policymakers with their density. So. The idea is this behind that if you have more interest organizations or populations, so for example, you have a lot of anti-nuclear, I don't know, uh, movements or organizations, then, then they tend to have uh, a lower access as a population because there are just too many. You know? So, uh, and then we have the problem, of course, of democratic backsliding, which is a... Uh, which causes actually a general closure of the polls. So it was found by uh, a, a Hungarian colleague of mine uh, and, and his colleagues that um, they studied Hungarian human rights NGOs and they looked at whether it is, it is the funding, so it is, it is this, the attempt of the government uh, to, to curb funding for human rights NGOs, which are, they are actually really successful at actually in that, uh, or this kind of closure of, 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 the, of the political opportunity structure, so the lack of, of, of access to policymakers that that make them to change their strategies. And they found it's not really the, a problem of finances or founding that, that makes them to, to change the strategies, uh, but this kind of lack of, of access to, to the policy making uh, apparatus, and not only to politicians, but, only, but also to, to the bureaucracy, to, to um, where, they, where they actually had a really important, uh, important role to play for example, in migration or dealing with, uh, with uh, imprisoned people in prisons and so on and so forth. So human rights organizations were, were important in this, in this work, but now they are completely shut out from, from this, even in this, not, from the, not only from the political, but also from the bureaucratic uh, um, neutral arenas. Uh, and that's why they, they found that they changed their focus from advocacy to social embeddedness, community building, and raising awareness, which is actually in line with, with our expectations. So Eisinger, in his, in his seminal work with, uh, in 1973, um, explained the protest movement in, in, in U.S. cities, uh, in the United States, in the United States and cities, exactly with this, that when you have a close, uh, uh, close uh, policy-making apparatus, then you have protest uh, and not, uh, not deliberation. Uh, so, how to measure the deliberative component of, 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 um, of uh, democracy? Uh, luckily, uh, our colleagues in Zurich uh, 
um, helps help us in, in, in that as well. So the VDEM uh, database, uh, it's really uh, important if you are doing uh, studies on democratization and democrat democratic quality. It has a component index, uh, so a part of this complete VDEM index. This one index is, uh, is, on, uh, is about uh, deliberation, so deliberative quality of democracy. And uh, here you see the change since the EU accession uh, of, of the 10 uh, post-communist countries, or 11 with Croatia since the EU accession uh, till 2019. And as you see, there is actually everywhere <laughs> a backsliding since the EU accession. Uh, and the worst case is Hungary. So Hungary it is an index from, from one, to, it's a continuous index from, from zero to one. And Hungary has a minus 36 points <laughs> Uh, uh, change since 2005, which is uh, which is huge, it's astonishing. So it's a lot. Uh, and Hungary now, as you see, is the last actually in in among these countries. So it has the worst uh, quality, uh, deliberative uh, quality, uh, quality uh, uh, democratic quality. It used to be actually quite high. So it was somewhere here uh, in 2005, but but since then it is in free fall. Um, so this, these are kind of our, our most important explanatory variables. And then we could test the framework. So the, this data set is com comes from actually from our, our project. You can also uh, read about it in the book. Uh, we have a so-called so population ecology database of Czech, Hungarian, Polish, and Slovenian national level higher education, healthcare, and energy policy interest groups. Which is just, which is to say that we counted these, <laughs> these interest groups in, in every country. So we have a, a list of interest groups since 1989, and, and we checked where, where they were, uh, when they were founded, or, or where they were dissolved, and, and we have, we know which interest groups were active in 2019 in, in these populations. Um, and then we conducted a survey among these organizations, um, and there you can see the response rate. Um, so these two data sets allows us to test the effect of the macro-political context because we can check the population ecology uh, kind of framework really precisely. We don't need to rely on some kind of a, um, some kind of a, um, ersatz, uh, so to say, uh, uh, variables, but we have the database for that. And we can also look at the, the survey data and, and, and merge the two. Uh, so our most important results, I will not <laughs> talk about, you don't have to, we will not talk about this table. It's just important that actually cooperation, so this is a bright side, that the cooperation, if, even if you control for everything, so cooperation between uh, interest groups uh, actually enhances access quite, quite a lot. So this is, I think, a, a good, good thing, that even though you have backsliding and you have a lot of problems, if interest groups cooperate, then they enjoy, enjoy higher access. So cooperation is, was measured, we asked them whether they cooperate in, in, in uh, fundraising, cooperate in, in strategies, cooperate in advocacy, and so on and so forth. Uh, and what is also, you can see the professionalization is also have these two stars, I mean, it's quite, quite significant. So the more professional, so if you invest in, in, in professionalization, you invest in, 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 your, in your staff, then actually uh, you enjoy higher access. But then let's see the, let's see graphically the most important um, uh, context variables. So uh, the legislative fractionalization looks at actually just you know how fractionalized is parla the parliament. And as you see, as we expected, uh, as Kitschot uh, told us already in 1986, it's important. So the more parties you have um, in, in parliament, the higher excess uh, you have. The excess is measured actually in a 25 point scale. So it's quite a big difference. And then if you look at um, the change in the deliberative democracy index, you see that there is also, it makes a difference. So, so the higher, uh, the, the, the lower um, uh, changes, so the higher the change, the higher the negative change, uh, because all change were negative, so I just took the, you know, <laughs> so I didn't bother with my zero as a minus, I just took the, the uh, as it is a, a number. So the higher the, the, the change, the lower uh, um, excess, uh, to, to policymakers, and then if you look at the population density, then the higher the density, the lower the excess, which is uh, again uh, uh, proves our theories. And then 
this is also for population ecology, the constituency size. So how many, so how many um, people or, or firms, so it's kind of it's different per, per, per population, but the, the larger the constituency uh, they, they represent, um, the higher actually the excess is, which is, which is again, I think, a bright, a bright spot here because it shows that, that important, um, um, uh, important policy areas where, which concerns many people, uh, those interest groups enjoy access even if you control for everything else, so for, for um, uh, democratic backsliding and, and all these, these contextual variables. So, okay, let's, let's leave uh, the bird's eye view. Um, and let's check how social dialogue in Hungary uh, was abolished, um, which is again now we move into uh, to some kind to to policies and policy outcomes uh, from this bird's eye view. So Hungary institutionalized a neo-corporatist uh, system of social dialogue, kind of modeled on, on Germany um, uh, in 1990. Already, actually, it was already. Actually, it was even before that because because the last communist government set up uh, in 1989 already a uh, um, um, system of social dialogue, which was then reinforced and, and, and changed and actually made much more um, uh, powerful in 1990. And not actually because the government was. Yes, the the government was actually also having these ideas because the the prime minister Josef Anton. Uh, was kind of, um, um, he was an um, old-fashioned Christian Democrat, and he looked at actually the CDU, CSU as, as, as his, um, as his uh, ide idol, so to say, and, and he idolized this kind of system, and, and he believed this kind of, in this kind of soziale Marktwirtschaft and, and no corporatism. But there was also a big, um, a big demonstration of taxi drivers when, <laughs> when the government suddenly, um, suddenly increased uh, 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 gas prices, um, so from took a, because they couldn't afford to uh, to subsidize them anymore, and then the taxi drivers and, and uh, actually um, uh, blockaded Budapest, and there was a stalemate for a couple of weeks, and and this this uh, no this this tripartite forum played a pivotal role in, in solving this conflict peacefully. So it actually. Uh, Made it stronger and and and, uh, and and contributed to its institutionalization. And although the system was subject to change earlier, uh, social dialogue was ab abolished in 2012, uh, along with the adoption of radically radically employer friendly labor code. And my book chapter, State Labor Relations in Liberal Times, um, uh, explains this by comparing. The first liberalization attempt by the first Orban government, Orban was always uh, very hostile towards, uh, towards organized labor, uh, but, but he couldn't, I mean, he couldn't uh, push through a full liberalization uh, that time uh, and the radical liberalization in 2012. So we have, it's kind of a natural experiment type uh, 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 setting because we have the same government and the same actors on both sides, so the same union confederations, and we have a different outcome uh, in two different time points. Um, so before we get into this, it's important to know that the post-communist labor is structurally disadvantaged. Uh, organized labor lost its welfare providing functions um, and privatization diminished the societal base. So in a, in a communist economy, um, unions are not organs of interest representation. <laughs> They are organs of, of welfare provision uh, to the workers. Because it's a worker state, so we don't need worker representation and, and, and strikes, yes? So what we need is, is welfare providing function. But, but of course, in a market economy, unions losing this, this kind of welfare providing functions. Of course, there are, for example, in Sweden, or the Ghent system, uh, where, you have, uh, where you have, there are in some countries, uh, labor unions administer unemployment insurance funds, but it's not the case in the post-communist region. Um, and privatization, so the, the, the privatizing, privatizing these big firms and closing them down, these big socialist firms, diminished uh, um, uh, its societal base. And, and, and you can see here the union density rates in Hungary. It starts with, with, all, with over 80% in 1990, and then in 10 years it's at 20%. 
so it's um, so it's a structural uh, problem as well that they are weak. Uh, but it doesn't explain anything, uh, everything, uh, these kind of structural constraints. So structural constraints are there, but you still have actors acting within these constraints. And um, Avdagic has a really good uh, framework for that. Uh, she says, she contends that there is no deterministic relationship between uh, this kind of structure, not cultural, but structure, sorry, structural constraints uh, and the new institutional setup and policy outcomes. And what is really important that she says that actors' core objective is actually maintaining their power under any circumstances. And, and, it, and preferred policy outcomes are only coming second. That's, that's really important to, um, to pay attention to this because it will pay, play a role later um, in, 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 in the presentation uh, and in, other, uh, in the other cases. Um, and in the post-communist context, uncertainty is graver issue than in the Western context um, because of this instability of the new institutional setup, because, because the actors don't have kind of decades of, 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 of interaction with each other. They are not as em socially embedded. So, so it's really, especially in this context of, of the immediate transition, so these first, the first decade after transition, it's really difficult to anticipate uh, this, what will the government do? What will the uh, what will the unions do? How so? So they are actually their choices reflect their perceptions of relative power rather than institutions norms. Um, then, the, uh, if if you if you look at uh, uh, Sweden, Finland, or Germany, you see also of course change and you see power struggles, but you have a much more embedded. Um, uh, institutional uh, solutions and, and institutions convey trust among actors. So if you have weak institutions, you have weak social trust. Um, and party politics also matters. So Klaus Armengen, who was, a, uh, who was my boss <laughs> and, and was a professor here, now he's in Zurich. Um, he, uh, he looked at this classic, classic partisan framework uh, hypothesis and, and, uh, and tested that also in, uh, on Central East Europe, and he found that actually it's not it's not that different. It's not different at all. So you need a strong left party in, in Central East Europe as well for uh, high union density rates, high collective agreement coverage, low employment protection flexibility, um, and you need a strong centre party, so some kind of a Christian democracy for low income inequality, um, and uh, and this is not linear causation we are talking about here. Uh, this is kind of a fuzzy set logic, which means that the presence of a necessary condition does not automatically translate to an expected outcome. It is conditional upon the context, upon, upon how uh, actors uh, um, interact with each other. Yes, and then Let's look at the status quo in 1998. So this is kind of the first liberalization attempt by, by the first Orban government. Um, you have, as I said, an institutional tripartite social dialogue uh, system. Uh, the Interest Reconciliation Council is the peak forum, um, which uh, responsible for minimum wage setting and the main forum for national wage setting negotiations. So maybe you, I don't, I don't know the Swiss system actually, but must be kind of the same. <laughs> and then you have the government, and the government was mandated to introduce the budget and the tax bill proposals first here before introducing them in parliament. So this is a really strong, uh, really, really strong mandate because first the social partners talked about the tax and, and the budget bill and then the political parties. But it was over in 1999. Um, Two new, two new forums were set up, uh, a Labour Council and an Economic Council, and the Labour Council was not a tripartite body any, uh, uh, longer because it was also kind of multinational companies and, 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 and the commerce of chambers were also members and the budget and tax bills were no longer discussed. The minimum wage could, could be set by the government in lieu of a tripartite agreement. And the Orban government made sure not to make any tripartite agreements, not to conclude agreements, so they set the minimum wage. Uh, and income policy was no longer negotiated. Um, it was set by the government and by law. Um, and the new institution uh, lagged any background structures, and these background structures were never created. 
uh, and the meetings actually by participants were just called audiences. So they, they went there, they listened to the government and then to the government representatives and they went home. Um, and uh, so this is kind of the, um, um, yeah, so this is, this, is, this is kind of the party system uh, properties and, and um, uh, in 1998, um, after the harsh austerity and pension liberalization, Fidesz won on an anti-reform pro-welfare ticket, actually. And they delivered on this, so they, they, they reversed some, some um, symbolic, uh, symbolic um, measures of, of the socialist uh, liberal government. Um, but their incomes policy and labor market policy were markedly right-wing. Uh, particularly in, in the public sector. And um, the Socialist Party in this time still had a strategic partnership with, with MSOS, the biggest uh, union confederation. This is kind of the, um, this was, this used to be the communist um, uh, um, confederation, it got a new name, but it was uh, that confederation. And they were able to exploit the discontent with these politics, with these policies. And by April 1999, the socialists closed the gap with the Fidesz in the polls, and the issue of union rights and social dialogue became part of their 2002 uh, electoral platform. And after they won the elections, they reversed these policies of Fidesz. So actually, this, 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 um, uh, although this this connection between um, the biggest union confederation and socialists was a disadvantage because Fidesz uh, attacked them with this, with precisely with this, uh, uh, with this link, and they were discredited a bit <laughs> because, um, because uh, of the uh, austerity policies of, of the socialist government and the pension liberalization. But as soon as the as social dialogue um, uh, came under attack, it proved to be a power resource, and it's important, um, an important power resource, and and these issues became salient uh, on the elections. So, so salient, actually, that in, that in paradoxically, in 1998, after four years of austerity and, 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 and a pension liberalization, holding left-wing views on, on the economic policy um, actually decreased the likeliness of, of voting for the socialists. But in 2002, after four years of Fidesz, it, it reversed back. So if you have left-wing views, you chose a socialist with a bigger, so bigger chance than, than than the right wing, so it was a it was a salient issue, and um, yes, so this is uh, so we had in, in Hungary a fragmented union structure, uh, as I said, diminishing union rates, density rates, uh, and um, and that was this problem of, of, this, of this link with the Socialist Party of the biggest union confederation. Um, and, but the government actually, um, of course, negotiated in bad faith. So they, they were actually, I, I looked at many newspaper articles um, to reconstruct the, these negotiations. And it was clear that they, they were pursuing a non-agreement strategy. So they were all along, they didn't want to uh, get an agreement on on the new structure of social dialogue and new and wage setting with the union. So they were putting forward always, um, always proposals that was, non that was unacceptable to any of the unions. So they, they didn't concede anything and, and they set a deadline for the, for the, for the uh, negotiations. And when the deadline came and there was no agreement, they said, okay, then we adopt what we wanted to adopt. Thank you. And that's what happened actually. And the unions could not agree to boycott the new forums, however, there were large demonstrations, and actually they never signed on, so they acknowledged the change, but they never signed on, never legitimized the new structure. Um, yes, and then I talked about this. And then what happened, what was the change in 2012, so the status quo 2010, as I said, after the victory, the socialists reversed these, these, uh, these social dialogue reform of Fidesz, and, and they, um, they brought back uh, the, the old tripartite forum with a new name, but it mostly had the functions of the of the old um, uh, council. And then, um, so what happened in 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 this in this time in, in 2011? Uh, in July 2011, tripartite social dialogue uh, was dissolved. Um, there was a new national economic and social council 
set up, which consists not only of unions and employers, but of trade and industry chambers and even churches. Uh, Orban had had a speech at, at the first meeting of this of this uh, the founding meeting of this new forum, and he said that that it is a fallacy to think that, that the issues of labor uh, and, and, and work is only, um, is only, is only the issue of, of, of employers and, and, and unions. It's a holistic issue, and that's why we have this, this really uh, encompassing uh, uh, organization. And the government representatives are merely observers, and it can only draft proposals for the government. So there's no negotiation, no consultation. They can draft proposals, and and put it forward to the government if they wish to do so. Uh, but there was a new consultative tripartite body also set up, but only for, uh, for the private sector. So any kind of social dialogue and, and any kind of interest reconciliation and, and intermediation in the public sector was abolished completely. And of course, this is also just a consultative forum, so it doesn't have the, the mandates of the old um, tripartite forum. And the new labor code, uh, was also adopted in December 2011, um, which reconceptualized employment relationship as a civil law contract. So this is this is radical because it assumes that it assumes that that employers and and employees are at the same level. So there's no power <laughs> uh, imbalances between them, um, and it allows actually for for uh, for even lower standards than stipulated in the employer and the new employer from the labor code. So because it says that they can contract freely uh, and, and, and agree to, to more over time if they wish so, as if it was kind of um, negotiations between equals, so as an em between employees and employers. Um, so this is a radical change. Um, and what what, have, what changed in the structure and, and, and of, of the context and what changed uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the constellation of actors. So the union structure remained fragmented. The union density rates have fallen to a mere 10.7% 10 10 by 2012, so it was even lower than 10 years ago. Um, and the tripartite for so the, the government again, this time was much more aggressive. They, not, they didn't even convene uh, the tripartite forum. They made sure that the right to strike was heavily cur curtailed before they made any changes. So in January 2011, actually in the public sector in Hungary, it is almost impossible to, to organize any strike le legally now. Uh, so it is telling that between 2006 and 2008, there were 40 incidents of strikes. And between 2010 and 2014, when the biggest kind of attack on organized labor in the history of the country was taking place, there were only 20. And out of which were uh, six was only warning strikes. So it, it tells you that the new strike law really, um, really uh, constrained the right to strike. And the government uh, learned the lesson from, from the previous uh, uh, liberalization attempt and played favorites with two confederations, um, making any united action impossible. Uh, they introduced direct government control over uh, government control over incomes policy, and they actually launched about their social policies and labor market policies the first national consultation, which they um, regularly uh, launch these kind of consultations. These are not consultations, so they just send out some kind of a questionnaire to citizens uh, where the questions are leading. So these are not real questions. So there's a, you know, you can. For example, they had also on, on, on George Soros uh, this influence, these kind of questions, and they have now they have a, a consultation on on LGBTQ rights, and they, there are questions: Do you want to that your that your the kindergarten children have access to to gender change operations? So this kind of you know th th this is this is what we are dealing with. So this is kind of these these are the questions we are dealing with, and then of course. Uh, the questions came back. The consultation was uh, was a success for the government, and then Orbán said that uh, that yes, it uh, we, we 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 know now that that Hungarians doesn't want Hungarians don't want free beer. That's what he said, and he implemented these these policies. So the party system properties actually uh, also changed, uh, and not just because they had a two-third majority. 
Um, uh, it is really, so Orban turned the Hungarian National Assembly, the parliament, into a low factory. In 2011 alone, it adopted two, 365 laws in the new constitution, whereas in the previous uh, legislative uh, cycle, the total output was 591 laws. So it tells you the, this kind of low factory. And of course, this sweeping agenda um, uh, had of caused a lot of conflicts, of course. So there were widespread protests. There were sometimes tens of thousands of people on the streets of, of, of cities in Hungary. But the opposition was not able to exploit the fact that Fidesz lost one-third of its supporters in one year. Uh, because there was a that was a fragmented opposition, the Socialist Party split into two parties, and the Greens and the far right, so they were they were mutually exclusive. Um, so, so Fidesz remained the biggest, far by far the biggest force in the country, and the MSOS, this this um, successor, communist successor, uh, and still the biggest uh, confederation, and the Socialists gave up on their social democratic strategy by this time. So they didn't. Uh, have this kind of um, close links together, which proved to be uh, a, a, mis a strategic mis mistake um, of, of these two organizations. Um, so, a conclusion. Um, just as the framework of Abdagic predicted, the strategies of the actors within the given structural constraints explain the outcomes and not, not just the structural constraints. Uh, as I said, Fidesz learned this lesson from 1999 and divided the confederations, not only by ideological lines, but also by sectors. So they excluded the, private, the public sector and they made some kind of, the, some kind of a deal with the private sector unions. Um, and unions chose keeping a seat at the table. That's what I said that you remember this, this in, in Avdagic's framework. So they, they, they chose to to, to remain to remain at the seat uh, uh, to, to keep kind of a negotiating seat uh, with the government um, uh, over uh, policy uh, and um, in 2011 the confederations so the chosen three big private sector confederations uh, legitimized this, this, these changes they signed onto the new structure whereas in 1999 they did not do that. Um, but Fidesz was also helped by the party system properties. So if, if there would have been um, a challenger party, a credible challenger party, they, I don't think that they would have been able to, to push through such a radical uh, liberalization. So again, uh, the framework of Armin John was also proved right because, uh, because this kind of radical liberalization was not, was condition, it's the condition of this liberalization was the collapse of the left. So you don't, of course, the necessary condition is to having a, a really strong right-wing party, but you also needed the collapse of the left for this. So this is this is what I'm. This is what when I when I said that this is not linear causation. So this is this is a fuzzy set logic. Okay. So let's then quickly move into the academic freedom question, which is kind of the the smallest unit in this. Um, in this big, in this um, uh, uh, picture on, on how uh, interest intermediation was was weakened uh, by uh, by illiberalism in Hungary. So, um, academic freedom has been under attack in Hungary since 2010. You can look up again. There are reports on that in and in Hungary in in, in, in in every aspect of 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 of, uh, of uh, academic freedom. Um, is now uh, a kind of a less free place than it used to be. And I compared uh, two protest waves um, in 2012 and 2013 and 2017 and 2019. And the empirical puzzle here is that um, there is an observed variance between the actor strategies between the two periods. So I made actually, I just stumbled upon this thing. I, I made a lot of interviews um, uh, with, with higher education uh, um, interest organizations, because because higher education is one of our policy uh, policy areas in in the project, and and I, I I stumbled upon this that every one from from the new organizations that were founded during the protest second protest wave of 2007 and 2019, they all said, and I didn't push them to say that, so they just all said that yeah we are we are for, we are forming a labor union. 
we are not interested in, in, in we are not interested in, in, in talking to the government because there's no I mean there's no meaning I mean why bother what we are interested in kind of this this workplace level um, uh, workplace level um, interest representation uh, we we want to have a collective agreement and we want to so so this was every every single one of these activists was, still, was telling me the same story without. I didn't ask them <laughs> about this. They just they just told me this story, and and it was a really big difference um, if you compare it with the 2012 and 2013 uh, uh, protest wave. There, the new actors uh, had deliberately lose networks. So those those actors that that was that were born out of this protest wave, they refused to to pursue some kind of um, some kind of a formalized interest group strategy. So they. They remained loose networks, and they had broad systemic goals, uh, and not this kind of smaller, you know, workplace level interest representation. So they were interested in in a fair higher education. Of course, the new actors in, in in the second wave also had this kind of goals, but but what they said is that 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 it is not possible. So it was not possible in this this environment. First, we need to we need to uh, get back to the we need to um, um, Change uh, the workplace level things in order to to then uh, uh, then uh, aim at uh, longer term or broader goals. Uh, so this was a big difference, and I asked myself why, how this this difference came to be. Um, and then there's a, there's another um, framework that helped me, which I which I knew already. So that's why I that's why it is important to read. Maybe you know, just read a lot because then you, then you stumble upon something, and then you can. Okay, yeah, there's a good theory for this, and there's a good theory for this from from a colleague of, of mine, uh, Imre Sabo. Um, he's Hungarian, but he's in the University College of, I think, in Dublin now. Yeah, he's in Dublin, and um, and um, he uh, said that the new actors face a different dilemma than old actors. So we we, we already. We already discussed that old actors tend to have an overwhelming incentive uh, in choosing even a diminishing status quo uh, over preferred policy outcomes, whereas new actors uh, face a dilemma between, sh between short-term strategies of mobilization and long-term organizational survival and, and, and long-term structural embeddedness and stability. And they tend to actually fail on both fronts. So first, they have a uh, they have a good um, uh, success with with, uh, with putting uh, things on the agenda, but then they lose out to to establish actors and then dissolve. So this is kind of what we see in, in Hungary and Eastern Europe usually with, with new uh, uh, movements and new um, uh, interest interest kind of these new interest organizations um, uh, in labor movements. And in 2012 and 2013, that's what happened. So this is kind of the context of the of these of the 2012-2013 um, uh, protests. So there's a new higher education law in 2011, uh, and there which which constrains uh, uh, academic freedom and the freedom of the of of, of, uh, of uh, universities. And there's a permanent austerity. So you see that Hungary uh, is below. Even the post-communist EU members average uh, in 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 terms of uh, G, uh, in terms of government spending and tertiary ter education uh, as a proportion of GDP. So there's a permanent austerity uh, going on, and then there's there's this idea of radical reduction of of state finance student places at universities. They were already radically reduced in 2012 and 2013, particularly in in finance, economics, communications, and law programs. And then Orban announced that for 2013 and 2014, there will only be 10,500 fully state-funded places kept. And then all hell broke loose. Um, uh, the, 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 the main organization of, uh, of the protest wave was Student Network, Ho Ho, Ho Gatui Hao is a student's network. Uh, they were a loose network. Um, and, but they actually occupied the biggest university in Budapest for weeks. Uh, they actually just organized a forum at, at ELTA, this is the biggest university, the social, of course, at the sociology department. And, uh, and this, this, this forum turned into a big march. Uh, 
usually in Hungary, university forums tend to <laughs> sometimes tend to, to uh, uh, turn into big marches. That's how the 1956 revolution actually also started uh, at the Technical University. Uh, now it was the ELTE, uh, uh, sociology department. And then they, they occupied uh, ELTE, and there was also uh, in the countryside the big universities protests. And then even the National Conference of Students Self Governments, which are not really uh, uh, not really seen as a progressive organization. They, they even they joined and they also held. Uh, they joined Ho uh, Ho, uh, and they they joined forces. Um, and they, even the Rectors Conference, which is not, which is even a less progressive <laughs> organization, joined into the protests uh, because, of course, it was a big issue for them. Uh, and then um, an independent um, um, network of academics. academics uh, was also established, and they also uh, remained a loose network. And what happened is that, um, is that of course, uh, the established organizations um, made a deal with the government eventually, so, and, and left uh, uh, the networks out in the cold. Um, so first, they, they formed uh, these organizations, they established the new organizations, uh, National Higher Education Intermediation Forum, but then Orban saw that this is really so. He, they are always making a lot of uh, like every week different polls, and and of course he saw that this is not a really really um, uh, really popular issue. So in two weeks um, they said, okay, we let's forget about this this reduction. We freeze the places, uh, the the state finance places as they were in 2012. But remember, this is also already a radical uh, radical reduction. Um, and they quickly drop, so they, they drop these plans, and then they managed to get an agreement, conclude an agreement with the uh, HEOC, which is the uh, uh, the big student organ established student organization. And then they set up a new forum, a new roundtable, higher education roundtable, where they only invited the established uh, organizations, and even the, the union, the big union of, of, of uh, the big higher education union was invited, and they went, uh, and they kind of signed, they legitimized these these. These, these policies of the government, uh, and they, they, they kept then the, the reduced level of 2012. Uh, the student contracts, which uh, I didn't talk about, that this is, um, uh, you can look it up, were implemented, and um, the financing remained completely arbitrary. So now the government can decide every year how many, uh, how many state finance student places there are. Before that, there were like r rules and regulations for that, but now it's kind of, you know, if they, they wake up, and they say 50,000 is 50,000, and they say 40 is 40. And austerity was kept. So if you look at this, so you can evaluate this deal by looking at the, this, this, um, the, the finances. As you see, the rectors didn't get more money, <laughs> even though they, they signed up for, for these changes. Um, and then uh, the new, uh, so the new round, uh, where is that? The 2017 protest. Where is that? So now I'm, I lost in this crazy presentation. This is actually Hungarian software. Really looks really good. Looks really great. Uh, it speaks German as well, and English. So, um, so we are again uh, five or seven years later, and there we have another protest wave. So these are huge protest waves. Okay, so. So in 2017, there were 70,000 people on the streets of Budapest. So, because of higher education policy. So this is this is an important issue. Um, the context of this is that there was a dual leadership reform in 2015, where chancellors were appointed uh, by the prime minister, uh, who are responsible for finance and management and administration, and that's kind of a, and, and the rector is only uh, only responsible for academic issues and the two executive are equal and interdependent, and there's no real boundaries between there. So there's it's kind of a power play struggle between them. And, um, and then in 2007 and 2019, uh, there was a kind of a concentrated attack on, on academic freedom. First, we had in March 2017, the so-called Lex CEU, uh, which was a law um, supposedly um, to ensure quality uh, so to to or to regulate foreign institutions in Hungary, operating in Hungary, but it was formulated in a way 
that it made impossible f only for the Central European University to operate in Hungary. Uh, so this is, you know, uh, and in June 2018, uh, the government uh, introduced a, a, leg a law uh, which said that they will kind of take away the Research Institute Network from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. So this is, this is again, the Academy of Science system is a Soviet um, legacy in every uh, East European country, but it doesn't mean that it's a bad legacy. So the, actually, the, the Hunger, the, this is Research Institute Network of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences was really successful. And, and, um, and together with the CEU, uh, these two institutional networks were the responsible for Hungary's primacy in, in getting European um, uh, European uh, uh, research funds into into Hungary, which Hungary had double or, or three times more than Poland. Uh, and Poland is four times as big as Hungary. So it tells you that these institutions were actually quite good at so working with. You know, if you look at the, of course, CU had a had a lot of money, but but the uh, but the Hungarian Academy of Sciences did not have a lot of money, and these these people are working for I don't know four five hundred euros a month. And still, we're winning a lot of good research and doing a lot of good research projects. Uh, and then the Haas, the Hungary American Sciences, were given 54 minutes to review the new law. That was the, that was, <laughs> they were given uh, 54 minutes. Uh, and then they said, no, actually, it was a surprising thing because um, uh, it's a world famous mathematician who was the president of the Hungary Academy of Sciences at the time. And he said no. Uh, and that was a big surprise for everyone. <laughs> Um, and in August 2019, uh, 19, um, 18, uh, the government revoked the, ac the, the accreditation of the only Hungarian language gender studies program of the country. The other gender studies program were in English at the CEU, but the CEU left eventually to Vienna, so there's no gender studies anymore in Hungary. And then uh, in April 2019, the Corvinus University, which is an important university, this is kind of the elite uh, economic university of Hungary, uh, became a private university run by a public foundation. Uh, I will not talk about this. This is, a di this is a different problem. But since then, actually, almost every university was put into this kind of uh, public foundations. Um, and these public foundations boards are filled with Fidesz politicians. So this is kind of the, uh, the idea behind it. Um, so the actors of, of the new protest wave were the Hungarian Academy Staff Forum, uh, the RDF, uh, Academia Dolgozat Forum, but they were the most important organizations. So they organized um, huge demonstrations uh, in in in, um, in defense of the of the uh, Science Academy. And the Student Union is a new actor. Uh, they born they were born out of the of the actually of the protest wave protecting the CEU. Um, these are really they are really uh, consciously leftist uh, um, um, uh, students who actually try to uh, also, um, so they have connections to unions and, and workers, so they are really doing this kind of cross-class cross, cross coalition thing. Uh, and then um, some, uh, some professors at, at, at the biggest university, Alta, were fed up with the, also with the big higher education uh, union, and they joined forces with, with uh, with a public education union, uh, which were never, uh, never really present at the, in higher education, the PDS, the Democratic Union of Teachers, which was, uh, which was established in 1988 as an anti-communist uh, uh, education uh, union. And, they, um, and now they have, so this, this union now have uh, chapters at, at universities, and because they have a much more uh, conflict-prone uh, uh, approach, they don't negotiate with the government, they, they do strikes, they, they, so they are kind of, um, uh, kind of the tough guys <laughs> in, in education. Um, so the outcomes, uh, the, the outcomes are not good. So there are no good, there is no happy end here. Uh, the research network of the, of this, of the academy was taken away, nevertheless, um, and it was reorganized, uh, now is government controlled um, completely. But uh, what, the, what, what the forum of, of this, what this organization of the, uh, the Academy Staff Forum achieved is that uh, the government could not divide the different research networks because, of course, there are conflicts. So, for example, the, the, um, 
the natural science researchers are looking a little bit down at the social science researchers, and, and they have, of course, fights for, for funds, for funds but, but, the, but the Academic Staff Forum uh, was able to organize at every research institution chapters, and they kind of presented a united front. Uh, so nobody legitimized this power grab from, from the Hungarian Academic Sciences, which is a surprising event. Uh, the CEU, although there were uh, 70,000 strong demonstrations in, 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 in its defense, had to leave the country, uh, although it complied with all the kind of absurd legislation that was thrown at it, uh, the Orban government uh, just refused to sign the agreement with New York State. They just refused, because the, 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 the American programs uh, of the CU are accredited in, in New York, in the state of New York, and and they, they, they had a regulation that they had to conclude an agreement with, with, um, with New York State, but they did, not, uh, they did not conclude this agreement. And the CEU eventually had to leave because they couldn't accept new students. So they left to Vienna and they kept their campus, but there's no teaching anymore uh, in Budapest at the CEU. So um, I hope that you could <laughs> get in all this information. Uh, and I thank you for your attention, um, and uh, let's have a discussion in the remaining time. Thank you. Better. <laughs> um, but I will also um, look around first if somebody else has a question and would like to start. We all still thinking. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, Regarding methodology and this access um, to policies, policy makers, do you also then separate and try to value what kind of um, people have access? Because, of course, we talked a lot about union near, near um, faction or groups and the higher education, but in yeah. like common discourse, like lobby groups also are then related to exactly the negative to democracy. Yes. Uh, yes, so, so we had in this survey three policy areas. And in energy policy, we have a lot of business groups. So in, in higher education, healthcare, healthcare as well. Uh, not in higher education, there's not much business in, in, in East Europe in, in higher education. It's not the US. But yes, so, so we have a different variable that says that it is, you know, it is a business group or it is a it is, um, so yeah, we, we looked at that. And what we asked in this access question is, is that uh, there were five questions that whether they have, how many, you know, how frequently they have access or they, they meet with, with uh, their government, with the regulatory authorities, which are not kind of the politi political, but the kind of the bureaucratic, uh, uh, with, with the gover governing parties, opposition parties. Um, and actually what is really striking that in Hungary, there's no parliament, so parliament doesn't play any role in this kind of things. Whereas in Poland, uh, which is also kind of an example of backsliding in Poland, the parliament is really important. So this is kind of a lot of things going on in parliament uh, regarding interesting for mediation. So in Poland, actually, there's, Poland is in a much better shape. <laughs> Um, you said it before, but also right now, um, that the parliament does not play any role, really, uh, within the government. Um, what are the expectations for the parliamentary uh, elections that are coming up? Is this going to change anything? In Hungary? Yeah. Well, yeah, we can talk about that as well. So, uh, so just to answer your question, yes, now there's a change in, in, in the party landscape. So the opposition parties, six parties, uh, it's really fragmented still. Uh, they join forces. So this is kind of a, um, so to say, rainbow coalition. 
Um, uh, that's how it was called in, 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 in other uh, other uh, contexts. Uh, so even the far right, the your big party, and and the socialists, the liberals, greens, everybody is, is is together, and of course they all needed to kind of the orbit moderated itself and, and get rid of the, the worst people uh, in the party, but they always have a, they every week has some kind of a scandal with a, with a politician that, you know, from the past that what kind of comments they made, uh, anti-Semitic or, or racist, and then some, so there's always some, some issues, but these parties nevertheless made an effort to kind of, to, to, make, to, to have a united front. And actually now there was primaries, so they made primaries uh, because there are, Let's not get into the Hungarian uh, electoral system, but you have also single-member districts. So, so it's important to have a unif uni uh, one ca opposition candidate against one Fidesz candidate, uh, and that's they did primaries, uh, and it was a success. So there was uh, the uh, 633,000 people uh, participating in the primaries, which is actually better than the U.S. So it's, it's, it's proportionally, it's, it's better than the U.S. Um, it's really high. And uh, now there's a, sec there's a runoff, the second round of the prime minister candidates um, uh, this week, actually, uh, because they, they agreed that the prime minister candidate was not, will not be elected in a, just in a kind of a first-past-the-post uh, manner, but, but in two rounds. Um, so the, so the, 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 the first three uh, candidates uh, could participate, and now there's only two candidates because one stepped back, uh, in, fra in favor of another, and it's really interesting because the, you have um, the wife of Ferenc Gyurcsány, who, is, um, who, who used to be a prime minister in Hungary, and he's a really controversial figure, so it's kind of a, either you love him or hate him, and that's a big problem, of course, for the opposition. And his wife, she's, she's a really capable uh, politician and, and a really uh, yeah, a good uh, a lawyer, and, and she's, she's the candidate. For, for, for the leftist candidate. And there's another candidate who's a kind of um, anti-corruption um, anti populist uh, right-wing uh, mayor from a small town. Uh, and he's kind of the surprise guy. So, so he, um, <laughs> and now there's a fierce, there's a really fierce campaign. So it's like, kind, of, kind of like Bernie Sanders against Hillary. Really, they are, they are really, this, this is really, really awful what, they, what is going on. But, but nevertheless, it's, um, there's, there's a lot of people participating. The debate yesterday, uh, on RTL, the Hungarian RTL, uh, they, there were more people watching than the than the than the European Cup. So it's really it's really they might have a chance now. The opposition uh, with this kind of coordination and this Fidesz is completely so they they Fidesz usually um, dominates the agenda in Hungary, but now they are just running after the events. They 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 are their campaign that was. That was actually, um, they had a really, really, really uh, uh, expensive campaign against um, the mayor of Budapest because they thought that he will win uh, the prime ministerial candidacy, but he stepped back in favor of this, this, uh, this small town mayor. Uh, so now they've spent actually hundreds, like millions of euros of taxpayers' money, of course, uh, on, on this campaign. And now they have to kind of reinvent the campaign, but they, so it's kind of a, it's really, really interesting to see that, that, it's, that it works, this, this primary reason. So we'll see what happens. Uh, but it looks better than, than any time in the last 10 years, yes. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to thank you as well for your presentation. presentation? Yeah. Um, I was once again impressed by this long list of governmental measures to hollow out democracy. But what I was wondering now, and uh, I hope you have an answer, is, I mean, is this a homegrown? Are these, um, did the Orban system learn by itself, or did it have impulses or role models from outside, or historical role models? Or is this all homegrown, or is it a try and error? Like, you try how far you can go, and then you implement a new law, or, um, I mean, um, I, I, I was always wondering, like, is there a connection between Poland and Hungary, or Hungary and ma maybe the, um, American conservatism, or whatever? You know, I was always wondering, are there role models for this whole system? Because it's so waterproof, I mean, it's like Teflon. And, um, and they always can continue when, with almost no rupture. I mean, you can, st you can still have protests and everything, but it, sometimes it does change things, as you showed. 
Um, but then again, there's a, 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 there's a new um, campaign to reduce uh, democratic structures. Yes. Yes, so yes, thank you. Uh, that's a very good question. I think it's a trial and error process, and, and of course they have contacts with, now actually it's a new thing that they have contacts to conservatives, so Tucker Carlson was just in Hungary, for example. So, uh, and of course it was a, it was a big, <laughs> it was really funny because he, he, he was in Hungary. Again, it cost, I guess, uh, the taxpayers a lot of money that he was there for several days, and then he went to a festival, to a Fidesz festival, uh, some Fidesz youth organization, I don't know. And then he was talking about, you know, uh, he was attacking China and Russia and all the, you know, and, and these people are, are really in, in friends with China and Russia and they were sitting there, okay. So Tucker Carlson really didn't really know where he is or, but, but anyway, so, so they have this, but, but no, it's, it's homegrown. So this is a trend that are in Poland. I think that Poland is a really different, so I, I don't like to, to treat these countries uh, um, the same, that put this basket in the same basket. And, and this is actually what our, what our research also proved that in Poland, this, this backsliding is nowhere near uh, Hungary. Uh, and, and there's a lot of, I think there's also institutional uh, uh, causes for that, but, but you have a lively partisan politics there. Uh, peace is always hanging by the thread, so they always have to fight to win elections. So there's, they don't have two third majorities uh, like Fidesz. Um, and, and Orban isn't an ideological man, so it's not like Kaczynski. Kaczy I think Kaczynski is a bit crazy, so he really thinks, that, you know, he really believes in a lot of things, but Orban doesn't believe in anything. So it's once, you know, he's a liberal, once he's a, he's a conservative, once, you know, he's, he's actually a Calvinist, but he, but he poses with Catholic bishops. So, so I mean, it's, it's, there, there's really just power and, 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 and money and, and an accumulation of power, and it really thinks like a lawyer. So this is why it's so waterproof, because it's really just tinkering with the law and, and regulations. Everything is legal because you have two third measures, and if, if something is, anti uh, is, is against the Constitution, you just change the Constitution. And that's what they do. So, so that's why it's waterproof, because it's, uh, and it's like really small steps, and then they make some concession here and there, but then, you know, when, when nobody's looking, they just implement it anyway. So this is a trial and error, which is going on now for, and now it's actually uh, a new phase where they, where they privatize the state into, into their own hands. So that's what, what happens with the universities, but it happens with a lot of, lot of areas. They give, they give a lot of money and, and institutions and, and, and land and, and huge uh, buildings to, f to these kind of public foundations, which are filled, the boards are filled with, with uh, Fidesz politicians and, and allied businessmen. And, uh, and they, they, I think they actually, you know, they are really building some kind of a parallel state structure because, because now they really have a chance of losing. So that's why they are doing this. Um, so we'll, that, that's, so even if they lose, the story is not over uh, yet. <laughs> Yeah, that would, would have been my, my next question. I mean, even if, if there is really a chance of a power change now, isn't like the, the fallout from, from these years of power is, is huge, right? Yes. Because undoing this, what has been done, uh, would take years and years, and I think something yeah, so probably we, cannot be Yes, undone. we have a really fragmented opposition coalition, which is really just going together by by... By, uh, by an electoral um, kind of need so that the voters were fed up with, with this kind of incompetence of the opposition, and that's why they have to now work together. But, but to undo these things, you need a really, you know, united kind of <laughs> uh, political will, and there's not no such a thing. And there are huge debates now with, with really with big uh, constitutional lawyers involved, how to undo this kind of legal, because it's kind of a legal... Um, Franken, as Franken state, like Kim Lee Chapel calls it Franken state, and this is really kind of a Franken state, <laughs> and, and you have to undo this somehow. And if you don't have a two-thirds majority, you will not be able to change, for example, social policy, and because everything is is is, is now um, uh, protected by constitutional majorities. Uh, so you need, if you want to change simple simple laws, you need a, a constitutional majority. So this this will be a really interesting. <laughs> Um, thing to see if they win, but the, but it's a, the chances are still slim. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Any more questions?
Well, if not, I once again want to thank you uh, for all your insights and presentation, and you leave us with a, a small glimmer of hope. <laughs> And I think not everything but, was, yeah. was, was bad there. So, of course, the, the, the outcomes are, are, are always look, look really bad and there's no happy ending. But, but, as, as, but I, as I showed you in the quantitative part, that, that there are things that, that work and that, 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 that are causes you know, optimism, that, that cooperation between interest groups and societal groups are, seem to be working and, and, and it's important. And, or professionalization, it's not... Of course, you need some kind of funds for that, but not necessarily. So, so you can do it by cooperation, by learning from peers, and and so these these things these things work. And then there's also these new movements that sparked by protest movements. They also kind of learned. You see, they learned uh, from and they adjusted their strategies to the context, and they are focusing on things that they can solve, and that can be kind of a, a base for for a rebirth of interest intermediation if they are really looking at you know this this um, workplace level interest intermediation and really strengthening it because because uh, established unions forgot about that because they were too much involved with with, with uh, negotiating with the government which was of course also important so i'm not i'm not speaking against these unions so in, in, in such an environment i can understand that you choose to sit at the table and not you know give up that because you still can get some things done if you are if you are represented so it's not it's, a, it's not that they are the bad guys here it's uh, these are dilemmas impossible situations which have to be somehow you know you need to make a decision and uh, but there are i think things that, that that are that we can be optimistic about <laughs> that's a good note as well <laughs> and um, thank you everyone for coming and for discussing and in two weeks time we'll actually be looking at poland when martha buchholz comes and really looks at the rule of law and the change to the rule of law in Poland over the last years. I think this will be a really interesting discussion as well. Thank you.